we continue <clears throat> with the Bhagavad Gita. We are at chapter 7 and we are at verse 24. I'm reading the verses 24 to 27. The unwise believe me, though unmanifest, as having come to manifestation, not knowing my supreme, immutable, and unexcelled aspect. I am not vivid to all, veiled by the Yogamaya. This deluded world does not know me, who am unborn and immutable. I know all the past and all the present ones, O Arjuna, and all the future beings. No one, however, knows me. Through the delusion of the dual opposites, which arises through desire and enmity, O descendant of Bharata, all beings enter delusion at the time of birth. O scorcher of enemies. These verses explain the illusion, the world illusion that we experience from the time of birth. This is also known as avidya. In the Yoga Sutras, it is referred to as avidya for the individual. At an individual level, we say avidya. At a cosmic level, it's known as maya. It's one and the same. It is the play of dualities. These dualities give the illusion of the world. We get lost in this manifestation. This world around us is a manifestation. And through this experience of dualities, through the experience of hot and cold, through the experience of pleasure and pain, through the experience of sorrow and happiness. Through all these dualities that we're experiencing all the time, we believe in this world illusion to be a reality. It is an illusion though. And we do not know this because of Yoga Maya, it's known as, it is, it's like a veil and it falls upon you at birth because at birth arises two dualities and these are Icha or will and Dvesha, that is aversion, also known as desire and aversion or attachment and aversion. These are dualities which then set the play of consciousness into motion. It is a vidya or an illusion as long as we see this as dualities and we suffer, we go through ups and downs. When we learn to witness this, it is no longer duality, but we see it from a non-dual standpoint. We become witnesses. When that happens, that world is no longer an obstacle. There is no suffering. You go beyond that and this maya is then converted into shakti. You don't see it as an obstacle anymore. Therefore, it's not maya. 
you see Shakti, very positive, very affirming, dynamic Shakti, which transforms you, gives you a feeling of power, wisdom, and access to infinite resources. Who has these infinite resources, that eternal wisdom, the unmanifest one, the unwise, they do not know this aspect of divinity. You are lost in these forms and you don't see beyond the forms there is something that is formless. From earth, we can make little figures, we can make little pots, we can make lamps, we can make many things out of earth. These are forms. But if we break them all up, smash them all up, it goes back to earth. It loses its form. And what is that formless? That formless is then earth. It's all earth. The lamp is made out of earth. The pot was made out of earth. The little figures were made out of earth. It was all earth. Yet, we thought it was a pot. It was a lamp. It was a figure. Forgetting that, in fact, it was all earth, all clay. Thus, these manifestations that we see around us, different people, they all come from consciousness and they take this form. You see different people. Some people you see are big some are small people, children are small people, adults are big people, some are women, some are men, some are tall, some are short. So they take different forms. But behind this is pure consciousness. And that is the stuff we are made of. Worshippers who worship deities, idols, they focus on the form. The deity has qualities. If you think of a deity like Ganapati, what qualities does that deity have? Wisdom, there are many, many qualities of Ganapati and these Qualities are that which the, the worshipper worships. Forgetting that behind this clay object is only consciousness. So all these are manifestations. but made out of the same stuff. If we take golden necklace, golden rings, rings made out of gold, bangles made out of gold, earrings made out of gold, all the things are made out of gold. But what do you see? You see a ring, you see a earring, you see a necklace. As you put them into the fire, it melts. And all that you see then is gold. It was all made of gold. So this is the unmanifest one. And we all and all beings, all objects, the universe manifests out of the unmanifest pure consciousness. This world is Maya 
as long as we are ignorant of its true nature. When we know its true nature, it is Shakti. I would request those of you who write me private messages when there is the meeting not to do so because I cannot respond to private messages. If you wish to ask a question, you may write it in the public chat so that everybody can see your question. Any, any questions to this so far? Balaji, you had something you wanted to ask? Uh, Sumit, what's the problem? You can't hear me? Uh, Joachim, maybe you can just speak to Sumit. Uh, he seems to have some problem. Yes, Balaji, your question? Or oh, you wanted to say something? Is it about uh, That's what uh, I was trying to make. Yes, the five elements. Yes, this is, uh, it manifests in the form of the five elements, but not only five elements. Um, the, in the last session, we talked about the tattvas. And there is a whole process which goes from the subtle most to the, to the, to the grossest. So it begins with with pure consciousness uh, manifesting into manas, buddhi, chitta, ahankara, manifesting further down into um, the, the senses, you know, the five cognitive senses, in more grosser form in five active senses, then into the Tan Mantras and finally into the Bhutas, which are the five elements, fire, air, space, earth and water. The order was a little bit off, but um, these are the five elements. So that's the progression from the subtle to the, to the gross. And that's the process of manifestation or evolution and through meditation we seek to go to reverse the process in a process known as laya or laya yoga to go back upstream so to say from the gross to the subtle to the subtle most so the it's not about five pan, you know the five elements of the panchabhutas these verses are about the entire concept of manifestation modern way of thinking uh, is is very related to some of the religions of the book the concept of creation and through scientific theories like Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, recent studies in um, you know the creation of the earth and and uh, these scientific um, uh, knowledge that has been acquired, we we tend to believe um, there's something like a creation, and then maybe there's an end of the universe. The Yogis, the sages have always said that we do not have a concept of creation. It is a manifestation and then there is a dissolution. It's cyclical in nature. So the universe is formed, it goes back, it comes forth again. In the next verses, in the next chapter, we will be also dealing with that. A little bit further but this idea of manifestation is really 
very important distinguishing factor. Okay. When we understand this, we also understand that we are living in this world, therefore we must learn the laws of this world. This is the world of dualities. We are also talking about the non-dual state of witnessing. And that's a separate thing. It's a different world in a sense. It's not really a different world, but it's an observer or a witness. And so we must learn to master both of these. The Bhagavad Gita is one of those few rare texts which really does both. It does not neglect this duality. It does not reject it. It teaches us how to live in this duality, becoming witnesses and attaining the non-dual state. Any further questions, thoughts, comments? If not, then we just continue. To the last verses of this uh, yes last three verses of this chapter those people of meritorious deeds whose past sin is reaching an end they freed of delusion with regard to the pairs of opposites devote themselves to me with very firm vows of observance they who resorting to me endeavor for freedom from old age and death come to know the entire Brahman, the complete spiritual affairs and the entire range of action. They who know me with reference to the beings, with reference to the deities, as well as with reference to sacrificial observances, even at the time of their departure, their minds are united in yoga and they know me. Beautiful verses. <clears throat> Speaking about the evolved soul, the elevated souls who have evolved over many, many lifetimes to come to a point where they are beginning to recognize that there is something beyond these manifested forms. They are beginning to seek the formless. And when they have freed themselves of the world illusion, which is this illusion that is created by the pairs of opposites, this duality, this maya, when they have freed themselves from that, they have undertaken firm vows and established themselves in the state of a witness, these are adhikaris, these are yogis, these are sages, these are saints who have attained something. And they would be free from old age and death. What does that mean? They live forever? Eternal youth? The eternal youth that this is talking about is not physical, but identification or realization of pure consciousness. 
then you go beyond the body, you are no longer identified with the body, and you are free from old age and death. When you are identified with your consciousness, you are beyond death. Because consciousness is life itself. How can life die? It is life. It's the nature of life itself. Once that happens, they know all of Brahman. They have a complete understanding of the entire process of manifestation and dis dissolution, or you can call it evolution and involution. As I said, it comes forward, the hidden comes forward, manifests itself, and then it returns back. They, they gain a complete understanding or they know this process, not intellectually, but directly. They know all the three states, the waking, the dreaming, and deep sleep. They know the beings, the celestial beings, deities. They know these worlds, these other worlds, and the beings of the different worlds. And because of this knowledge through direct experience, being completely established in it, they, they are able to maintain that state even at the time of death. Death is a separation from the body. And even at that time, they are able to maintain this awareness. These highly evolved beings are yogis, sages, those who have attained moksha and they learn through this how to leave their body consciously. In the next chapter, we go into greater detail into this idea or this um, practice as well of leaving the body consciously. So these three paragraphs or verses are about yogis, siddhas, adhikaris who have attained and maintain that state, stay established in it. Any questions so far? Any thoughts? Any comments? Gautam, everything okay with you there? Do you have any thoughts you want to share? Yeah, all fine, Nadikari. No okay. Good. Renu, would you like to say something? Yes, Radhikaji, I wanted to know if the most powerful. Um, maya so, or the, the pairs of opposite is it attachment because that's what you mentioned the one among all the opposites you mentioned attachment yes attachment and aversion these aversion, yeah. yes. is it the most powerful um <laughs> yes 
Um, there are five glaciers. One is uh, fear of death. The other is, um, you know, um, ignorance, of course. Then there is the, uh, there are the two opposites of attachment and aversion. And that is known as Raga Dvesha. Raga is attachment and Dvesha is aversion. There is actually no difference between the two. Raga and Dvesha, attachment and aversion is one and the same. They are two sides of the same coin. Okay. Okay. So if you take an object, let's take a car as an object or a mobile phone. You know, everybody likes these mobile phones very much. You get very attached to your mobile phone. Whether you are attached to it, and somebody says to you, you are looking at your mobile phone all the time, it's very annoying, you're not paying attention to what I'm saying, that person may develop an aversion to the mobile phone. In reality, it's the same because you are imposing your ideas of mine or not mine on that phone. The phone, actually on its own, has nothing. It's just the phone. It's just an object. But we give it a coloring. We say it's mine. It's not mine. It's with all objects. People as well. You know, there are many tragedies in the world. Many people die. Right? Somebody dies somewhere yeah. far away. You don't start crying. You don't get that upset. You read the news and say, oh, that's terrible. But you just move on. You don't give it much thought. But if somebody in your family dies, it's my whoever, you know, my son, my daughter, my mother, my father. And that my is what gives those things coloring. And that is called attachment or aversion. And this is what sets off this entire world play. It starts with these ideas. So the moment we are born, the child is raised. The mother, the father, the family starts with, I am your mother, so you create an attachment. This is your father, you have to be respectful. And that's how society world around us encourages and creates this attachment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't know if we can say strongest or not, but these are the two which um, come up prominently because the others are, you know, sometimes a little bit deeper and then they not necessarily uh, want to talk. Nobody wants to really talk about the fear of death. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes? Nobody even thinks of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't even want to think about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, this is what pops up immediately, you know, which at least one can uh, relate to. And say, yes, we can talk about it, but about fear of death, this is um, much deeper and requires a deeper contemplation and meditation to, to understand. Thank you. Okay. Good. So we um, spoke in these last verses about... Um, Departing from the body consciously, uh, that was the, the fifth glacier, uh, death, fear of death. So somehow we, we will come back to this now in chapter 8, Knowledge of the Eternal. This chapter is known as Akshar Brahma Yoga and it speaks about the immutable self. It speaks about uh, Brahman, about pure consciousness, the unchanging. That's what Akshar means. Akshar means unchanging, um, immutable, eternal. 
Akshara also means a letter, you know, in the alphabet, the letters are known as Akshar. Akshar is also a mantra. The mantra consists of Akshar. So they are related. Sound and the unchanging, immutable self. The imperishable. These are related. So we come to verses 1 to 4. But I will just read verse 1 and 2 initially because that is Arjuna's question. Arjuna said, What is Brahman with reference to the spiritual self? Ad Adhyatma. What is karma? O highest of persons. What is it with reference to beings? Adibhuta. And what with reference to the deities? Adidaivata is it said to be? What is it with reference to sacrificial observances within this body? Adiyajina, O Madhusudan, and how are you to be known at the hour of departure by those of controlled selves? So, Arjuna, the Adhikari, the perfect student, the ideal student, Asking some very deep questions. Since the questions are so deep, <laughs> we will just go through the questions once again to understand clearly what is he asking? What is Brahman? First question. What is Brahman? What is this cosmic self? What is this pure consciousness that pervades all? And what is it with respect to? Adhyatma. Adhyatma is the individual self. The other words for it, you may be familiar with it, are the individual self and the universal self. What is karma? What is this action and how is it related to the cosmic self. What is it related to beings, Adibhuta? So all the different souls, all these little manifestations, how, how is this connected to Brahman? And what is it with reference to deities? So basically he is asking about the nature of the universe. There are three planes of consciousness, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Similarly, there are three worlds, those of celestial origin, devas, the human plane and the asuras or the demonic plane. Now, some of you might say, hmm, we believe it, we don't believe it, that's okay, it's personal choice. The scriptures say that just as in a macrocosm, you have three levels of consciousness. At a, at a microcosm, they have three levels of consciousness. Similarly, at a macrocosm, at a universal level, there are three main planes. If you want to go deeper into it, there are actually seven planes of consciousness. But... Simplified version is three planes of consciousness, celestial, human and demonic. And this is in all the scriptures of the world. It is not unique to those scriptures coming from India or anywhere else. It is in all scriptures of the world, all traditions of the world, all, all societies have the same concept. He asks further, what is it with reference to this body? What is the connection between Brahman, the universal self, with reference to this body? And how do I know you at the hour of departure? 
You may remember the last verse of chapter 7 said at time of departure sages, yogis, siddhas are able to stay focused on that highest pure consciousness their mind stays in yoga in union so he asks so how are you to be known how do I do this Sri Krishna says the indestructible syllable the supreme Brahman the very transcendental nature is the inward spiritual self the emission which is the cause of the production of the aspects of beings is called karma. The perishable aspect is the one referred to concerning the being and the conscious principle purusha is of the deities. As sacrificial observances, it is I in this body, O best of body bearers. So, what is Krishna's response? Sri Krishna says, Pranav, or the indestructible syllable, Om. This is Brahman. Om comprises of the three states of consciousness. This is what Om means. It is explained in great detail in the Mandukya Upanishad. Om represents waking, dreaming and deep sleep, three levels of consciousness. And the one beyond, the fourth, Turiya, the witness. And all this, he says, is Brahman. So all the three levels of consciousness is Brahman. Adhyatma is the individual self. Adibhuta is the physical manifestation. That individual self manifests in Adibhuta, in this field here, in this body. And Adiyajya, this is the Lord of Sacrifices. This is the one who resides within this body. And all sacrifices are offered to him. What does this mean, all sacrifices are offered to him? We have talked about this much earlier, earlier chapters, where we said that sacrifices here is not referring merely to rituals, all of life is a sacrifice. All action that you do, all karma, is a sacrifice, is an offering. If you think you are the doer, you get lost in that duality, you get caught up in this cycle of attachment and aversion. But if all karma, all that you do, all your actions are done as an offering, to the Lord within, then you do not get caught up in this cycle of birth, death and rebirth. So he explains the basic concepts of universal self, individual self, karma and how Everything is an offering for the Lord within. You can say that these two verses sum up uh, the theory, the entire theory, yoga theory. Any comments, questions so far? The next verses are about um, 
leaving the body consciously. Before we dive into these, I just wanted to mention that we are having a retreat in September 2017, that's next year, in September from the 10th to the 17th. Um, I'm taking only a very small group, so a smaller group than last time. And so if, if anybody's interested, please get in touch with me as soon as possible, because um, already quite a few uh, of the places are gone, have been reserved, so we have only nine more left. And uh, that would be good if if you get in touch with me as soon as possible, if there's an interest, even if you may not be absolutely sure. Okay. So having explained the basic theory, the basic concepts, Sri Krishna now explains how to leave the body consciously. He who departs remembering me at the last moment after leaving the body, he comes to identify with me. There is no doubt in this. Remembering whichever aspect of mine, as he leaves the body at the end, he reaches that very aspect. O oh, son of Kunti, identified and always nurtured by that aspect. Therefore remember me at all times and fight. With your mind and intelligence surrendered to me, you will come to me alone without doubt. With a mind joined in the yoga of practice and wandering nowhere else, Contemplating the Supreme Divine Person, one goes to Him, O Son of Pritha. In these verses, Sri Krishna says very categorically that death is a chance. Death is an opportunity to attain liberation. Death is a transition between this shore and the other shore. During this transition period, there is a, a possibility to attain that highest. If you are aware, if you are sharp, if your buddhi is really, really sharp and you have practiced, Just as death is a transition period, so is sleep. Sleep is known as Sahodara, the little sister or the little brother of death. Every night you lay down and you're thinking something, you have a few thoughts and suddenly you're asleep. Are you aware of that moment when you fall asleep? Do you catch the first dreams coming? If you have that kind of awareness, and if you can then continue to be aware during this dream state, then you also can maintain that awareness when you die. I am not referring to remembering dreams in the morning after you wake up. I am referring to being aware of them while you're sleeping, while you're dreaming, and knowing that you're dreaming, and eventually be able to sit in meditation and allow the dream state to come forward. That is the consciousness, the level of consciousness we are talking about. Being aware, being conscious, being attentive. If 
you have that kind of awareness and you can hold that awareness at the moment of death and you remember the divine in its entirety, not just one part of it, but in its entirety, to hold, hold it, then you will be identified with the divine, even on death. But if you remember only a certain aspect, then you will attain that aspect. This verse is a little clue for us that the moment of death is not only a great chance of liberation, but the moment of death can also be a great trauma. All the traditions of the world have created rituals around death. Unfortunately, in our modern times, these rituals have been ignored, neglected, and even banned by law. For example, in most um, modern societies, once somebody dies, the body has to be cremated or buried within 72 hours, within about three days. Traditionally, however, the body was kept for up to 10 days to give this departing soul time to leave the body, to overcome its attachment to the body. And there were rituals done, practices done, which were to help the soul, to guide the soul on its last journey to help the soul to cross to the other shore. This transition can be very difficult if one is not prepared. And so there was traditions to guide the soul even when it has left the body. For one says that the soul itself can hear, can still hear you. And if the attachment to a certain aspect is very strong, maybe the attachment to the body, attachment to the relatives, you know, the loved ones, then you will be led by your attachments to your new birth. A famous story from the Puranas of a sage who was very attached to his deer. He had a fawn, a baby deer, in his ashram. And as he was dying, he was very concerned about who would take care of the motherless fawn. And so, in the next life, he became a deer. Lucky for him, he became a deer <laughs> that lived also in an ashram with a sage and so from a deer he became a sage again. So that was lucky for him. But if the mind is full of certain identification, a lot of attachment to certain things, then that attachment will pull you back. And so you will receive a body or you will Take a body in which you can live out those particular samskaras, those attachments. We just spoke about it with Renu, about attachment and aversion. These are kleshas, these are colorings. It's another word for samskaras. And our samskaras are what bring us back to this plane. So, of course, if you are very attachment, are very attached to pleasures, you know, wealth, then you may be born in a very rich family, wealthy family. But if you may not have fully attained, but there's a very deep desire in you to attain something in this next life, it might come to pass that you 
will find yourself being reborn in a family of yogis, sadhakas, seekers, those who would encourage your search for yoga rather than discourage it. So depending on your nature, you would receive the body. But if you remember that highest, you will get the highest. And this can only happen when you have done practice. Abhyasa. Okay, so any thoughts about this? It's a very deep uh, subject here. Uh, could you repeat the last part because I didn't quite understand it. Um, the last part was the samskaras are what um, help us to take the form that you have. Whichever body you take, it's uh, decided by your samskaras. These bring us back to this plane. So if your attachment is to let's say yogic wisdom, you will be born in a family where you can unfold those qualities. But if you're very attached to material wealth and uh, luxuries, pleasures, you will be born into a home where you can unfold those samskaras. But if you say, I want the highest, and you have had some practice before, and you're able to hold that awareness of the highest in you in those last moments during separation then that's what you will attain you will attain the highest moksha liberation okay okay thank you so the next verses 9 to 13 are very exciting interesting because now Sri Krishna says exactly how how to leave the body consciously. Okay. Verse 9. He who contemplates him, who is the master of intuition, the ancient one, the giver of all commandments, more minute than the minute, sustainer of all, Whose form is beyond thought, having the solar you beyond darkness? At the hour of departure, with an unmoving mind, endowed with devotion, with the power of yoga, making the prana enter between the eyebrows properly, he reaches the supreme divine person. The indestructible syllable that the knowers of Veda know, that which the ascetics, free of attachments, enter, seeking which they practice celibacy. I shall teach you that word briefly. Closing all the doors of the body and retaining the mind in the heart, placing the prana in the crown of the head, established in the concentration of yoga, Om, this is Brahman, consisting of a single and destructible syllable. He who, enunciating it, contemplating it, goes forth, abandoning his body, he reaches the supreme state. Good, now you know it. That's the answer. So the one who is able to contemplate the most minute. What is the most minute thing? An atom. Anu. It is called Anu. And that's the most minute thing. Can you see an atom? Renu, could you please uh, mute yourself because we're getting some background noise from you. Thank you. So the atom is the most 
minute thing that we know of. But nobody can see it. Those who know a little bit of physics, they tell us that it's actually nothing but a form of energy. That's what atom is. And that is exactly what it is. Energy is very subtle. So we could use a word here, more subtler than the subtlest. What is that? Does that sound familiar now? Subtler than the subtlest is pure consciousness. So he who can contemplate that pure consciousness, the Atman, at the hour of departure, with an unmoving mind. What is an unmoving mind? An unmoving mind is still. It's not moving outwards. It's still, which means manas, buddhi, chitta and ahankara are well coordinated. They're not disturbing each other. Manas is not running outwards. Ahankara is not revolving around his own self. Chitta is not bubbling up with memories. All of them are unmoving. They are still endowed with devotion, having a bhava, that deep longing to attain with the power of yoga, united with practice, making the prana enter the eye between the eyebrows. What is that? All the prana, all the energies of the body are now focused like a laser beam. What is a laser beam? It's nothing but very, very concentrated energy. And concentrating all the prana, all the energy that you have between the eyebrows. What is that between the eyebrows? That's a chakra. We know it, Ajna chakra. Concentrating there, he reaches the supreme divine one. That's what the ascetics want to know. That's why they, the people who know the Vedas, that's what they want to know. That's what they're practicing. What else do you do? Closing the doors of the body. What are the doors of the body? Does anybody know the doors of the body? Yes, nine doors. Yes, but no, not just Indriya. It's not nine doors, you said Shibu was correct. The Navdwar, Navdwar, the nine gates they're called. What are these? The ears, two. That means no listening. The doors are closed, means you don't have to sit and put your fingers there. Some some meditators, some traditions, scholar traditions, external practices, they do that. We don't do that because we train the mind in Samaya. So you don't need to close the ears, but you stop listening. The indriya of hearing is not going outwards. It's listening inwards. The eyes, the next two, means visual. The indriyas of sight. They're not looking outwards, they're closed, and they're looking inwards. Then the nostrils, that smell. You're not smelling. You're again focused inwards. Speech, the mouth, speech, active indriya. You're not speaking. It's also focused inwards. Even the inner speech is therefore controlled. What are the others? There is reproduction and excretion. These also are controlled. Reproduction means, doesn't mean physical, physical celibacy, even though it does mean that as well. It means having a mental stance that goes beyond the genders. It's celibacy. It's the highest form of celibacy. Where Ida and Pingala are united. You go beyond male and female. The last gate, that of excretion, is also controlled, which means the energies which are downward going, leading, are not moving downward, 
but they're moving upwards. So you stop the downward moving energies and allow the energies to move upwards. So when you are able to do that, closing all the doors, retaining the mind and the heart, that is bhava, same as above, and taking the prana to the crown of the head. So from Ajya Chakra, it goes to the crown of the head through Brahmanari, established in the Sahasrara Chakra. Om. This is Brahman. That's the direct experience of Om. And one who can contemplate on this, who can stay there in that highest state, he can go forth abandoning his body. And he leaves through the fontanelle, through the sahasra chakra, the crown of the head, and he leaves consciously. Generally, when people die, they leave through one of these nine gates, one of the navdwar. We may have seen sometimes <clears throat> somebody dies with his eyes open. That's because the soul has left through the eyes. May die with the mouth open. That's because the soul has left through the mouth. It is said by those who have experienced a conscious death of a yogi that you hear the little crack at the top of the head as the soul leaves through the fontanelle, the crown of the head or the sahasrara chakra. And that is how you can leave the body consciously. Well, that sounds pretty simple. I was teasing, of course. <laughs> So, I think that was quite intense. Anybody would like to comment on this or any questions on that? No, or maybe everybody is really woken up now. Fully conscious. Hmm. Well, I hope you enjoyed this session. I especially like these kind of sessions. But since um, there seem to be no more questions, and everybody is still contemplating on these beautiful thoughts, I leave you with these. Have a nice contemplative weekend and we meet up again next Friday, same time. Yes, Roseanne, thank you very much. I also think it was a very nice session. I enjoyed it myself. Bye, Shibu. Bye, Mita. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, most welcome. Thank you. Bye, bye Roseanne. Bye, Matthias. Bye, Debbie.